Mom, 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 do we have any methylated spirits? What? What are you wearing, George? The spaceman needs it. Well, the spaceman can make do with water. Yeah, we saw the Amiga Man the other night. Pretty, pretty bloody oh, Hello, little girl, how are you going? He's your guy. He's fast. Right? I mean, he's supposed to be a scientist, right? And he's walking around with yeah. his chalk in his pandemic. Exactly, exactly. Back to your bloody show? microscope, yeah, you know what I mean? I like bees. I know, that's my special no, no. perfume. But the missus liked it, you liked it, didn't you? <laughs> What's not to like about a child's from history? Dad, can I go to adventure, please? Yes, love, of course you can. Off you go. I Anytime there's a blackout, I just I feel so powerless. Oh. <laughs> just someone try and remind me where the fuse box is. Do we even have a fuse? What is a fuse box? Oh, it, is. it is this day. <laughs> Gentlemen, I give you the video sphere. What's that? Here's the demo, was that? <laughs> Powerpoint over there. Yeah. Warren, Warren, can you go and see what that mutt is barking at? Yeah, just a minute. Oh. Why isn't it bloody? <laughs> Warren, the dog, please. Would you just let me finish? George. Hey folks, and welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. From modulating game difficulty with machine learning, what UE5 does for Hollywood, to creating captivating media in twin motion, automotive look development in UE, and NASA lunar terrain visualization in UE5. There is something for everyone at Unreal Fest 2022, whether you're interested in games, film and TV, architecture, automotive, or simulation. Registration is going fast, so check out our full schedule of cross-industry panels and join us in New Orleans this October at unrealengine.com slash events. Get the inside story on how Unreal Engine's Quartz audio subsystem was synced with striking visuals to kick off Fortnite Chapter 3 Season 3. The resulting bioluminescent forest pulsated in time with procedurally generated beats. Learn more about the power of Quartz on the feed. Unreal Fellowship students are always full of ideas, and this group was no different. See some of our favourite clips from their final projects, covering everything from anime angels to interdimensional meetings. From ArcViz to dinosaurs, stomp over to our latest interview with Hashbane Interactive and learn how Unreal Engine's robust support for ArcViz opened the door for the studio's leap into game development and how Lumen and Nanite were crucial to the evolution of their doorway to a modern past, Instinction. Now on to this week's Community Spotlights. Get brewing, you've inherited your uncle's potion shop and his debt. Potiononomics by Voracious Games is a narrative-driven, deck-building shop simulator with some twists and stirs. Befriend or romance fellow vendors, learn new haggling strategies, customize your store and more. 
wishlist on Steam and get the potions bubbling. Could you save the future or yourself in space? You could try! Experience the intense exhilaration of spaceflight in Intercosmos from Ovid Works. Enjoy this wild, weird and wondrous VR game while exploring the awe-inspiring interiors of a realistic space capsule while mastering the crucial systems that keep you in orbit and breathing. Shuttle to the site for more! Inspired by Croft Manor, environment artist Brandon Carter poured years of passion and learning into creating this magnificent environment that just spills out memories, history and deep stories. Let them know what you think of the Ancestral Library on their art station. Thanks for watching, catch you next week! everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host Tina and today with me I have a couple of incredible guests. Um, <clears throat> I am recovering from a bit of a cold that really took me out for a bit, so if you notice me taking a lot of drinks today, um, don't worry, <laughs> I'm getting through it. <laughs> Um, but let's get right into introducing our incredible guest today. First up, uh, Thurston, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I'm Thurston. I am the, well, I, I guess I just call myself the founder of TT Studios. And we are working on a, a little passion project called Yosemite Forest Ranger. Uh, in my day life, I work as a cybersecurity consultant slash ethical hacker uh, in a company um where i do really cool stuff and um at night i'm a game developer i guess <laughs> the secret 30 life. years old and um yeah exactly <laughs> i'm batman <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'm simon no. and i'm the community manager of uh, tt studios and it's basically i became uh, become became friends with thurston during uh basically during COVID because I went into a lot more of uh, watching YouTubers and stuff like that. And we began playing together and then we had a back and forth with a lot of things. And yeah, basically we're with him from the beginning of developing this game. So yeah. That's awesome. This yeah. is, I cannot wait to get into the general development story of your game because it is so heartwarming and happy and just makes me feel all warm and fluttery. But before we get into that, Thurston, would you like to tell <laughs> us just a little bit more about the project itself and what we're going to be looking at today? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so Yosemite Forest Ranger uh, came to be as kind of a passion. So I'm a YouTube content creator or whatever they call it. I play video games and people like to watch it on YouTube. Um, and um, I've always had the passion to get into the Unreal Engine and start something. I never had a real purpose for it, so it always kind of watered out or whatever you call it. Um, and um, one day I just started fiddling with getting a um, topographic a real map of the Yosemite Valley in Yosemite National Park um, uh, imported as a landscape in the engine. And from there out, we basically just got into creating a game. And I'm doing that together with my community. Like Simon said, he used to watch a lot of my content. He probably still does, but there's not a lot of content anymore because I'm so uh, invested in game development. Um, and the game itself is, um, yeah. Do you really want to get into the story right now, or should we roll the trailer, which explains a lot too? Or what is uh, what? Oh, it's up to you. What, what do we do? What do you think? Should we cut to um, it? Yeah, let's get to the trailer and then talk afterward. Welcome to Yosemite Valley. 
You think the guy who wrote that down actually cared if he felt welcome when he showed up here? Yeah. Well, it was probably old man William after all. Good old granddad. So I guess I should probably feel welcome. You know, he had a much bigger heart than me. I haven't been here since I was just a little lad. Other than that one night. Nah. Oh! I can do here. I guess I'm walking. I can finally just take a true breath of air. And breathe in that cold, fresh mountain air. Full of possibilities and hope. You know, I could really start over here. Start a new life. A new life? I'm not really sure if I deserve it. But... I'm told that I should forgive myself, release all the pain inside. I can look for answers. Might not be the ones I'm hoping for, but they might be the ones that help me all the same. Grandpa used to carry me around pert near. I'd always get tired and complain about having to walk up the hills and walk down the hills and how the old timers always say. You know, they walked to school uphill both ways in the snow and the rain. Never had good stories, but I really felt that way when I was younger. You know, but Grandpa, he was a strong man. He'd throw me right on his back and carry me right over the mountain if I asked him to. But, changed my life for better, living off the land like the old man did. I want to get back to that. I'm looking for a more truer, simpler way of living. It's crazy what they did back then, with their bare hands, living off the land, making stuff that would last a lifetime. This cabin looks a little rusty, and a little bit worse for wear, but all intents and purposes, it's still livable, and it still looks pretty good inside, so I guess the old man did a good job when he built this place. <laughs> So go ahead and ask yourself, will Theodore be able to fill those footsteps his grandfather left empty? Will he find the answers that he's looking for? Will you be able to unravel his past? Do you have what it takes to become the next Yosemite Forest Ranger? Mm, familiar voice there at Love the end, that. huh? <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> I was about to ask that. Did we just have a cameo that I wasn't aware of? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. So, <clears throat> yeah, the funny thing is, we have uh, also a friend of ours uh, from, the, uh, from the channel that we met through being YouTubers. Um, and he is doing the voice acting for Theodore. And he is a, a true American. Um, as we are from Europe, so you can already hear it from my accent. If I tried this, it would not come across. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we had a few placeholders at first, and then we swapped them out. But I thought the narrative at the end of the trailer was good enough to stay in there like it is now. So yeah. Oh, I loved it. I did and, see um, in, the, yeah. uh, in the chat, someone mentioned that the voice actor gave them really strong nostalgia <laughs> so you <laughs> really hit that, yeah. that yeah. uh southern american yeah. feels there for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice yeah so yosemite forest ranger is um when you play it it might feel a lot like uh, a survival game um it has survival and crafting and skill and stuff aspects um, but the main focus is about the story. So um, we tried, it's an open world setting in the Yosemite Valley, and we try to uh, incorporate a story into the open world gameplay. A lot of storytelling is very linear, and I always love being able to freely explore the, the area around you. So I felt like, okay, we need to find a way to make this a story game because we had a good story and we also 
well, I also want it to be open world. So we need to find a way to connect those two. Um, and I think we've done that pretty well so far and we're not done yet. Um, yeah. The, should we get into the story or whatever? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I can tell you, you about the story. Yeah. Best starting point. I have no idea what the best starting point is. Um, Let's so, start with the story. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, um, as we also stated on our Steam page, um, the game is about Theodore, our main character that you just saw in the trailer. Um, Theodore, uh, Theodore Thompson is um, somewhere in his 60s um, and he is retired. He had a very roller coastery past, I guess you could say. Um, a lot of stuff happened. I don't want to get too much into it because you need to find it out in the game. Um, but he had a very, very vibrant past, a lot of roller coaster moments. And he, his father used to be a forest ranger here in the valley. And, um, basically Theodore was just over and done with the life he had. And he knew he comes to the valley and um basically feels the footsteps of his grandpa um and as the player of the game your um your well not task but the idea is for the player to um uncover the backstory uh, about theo what he's been through um what made him who he is like like well simon said at the end of the trailer um will you be able to find the answers um and in the trailer, there were, were already a few sneak peeks and, and um, how do you say, the hints about the story. Um, but yeah, yeah, f f fill me in. Uh, f f yeah, Frost. Yeah, that is about it, basically. Um, I would say that it has changed quite a bit throughout the development of, of the game as well. So. Yeah, but the storyline will also not, in the game as it is now, it's not that much developed. And that's basically because all the other assets in the game are going to play a huge thing inside the storyline as well. And having that in the game uh, first makes it easier for, uh, for Thurston and... Uh, to expand the storyline afterwards when basically all the fundamentals of the game, the gameplay and the things that we're missing now, uh, when that's put in. So only a little snippet of, of this backstory is uh, being hinted to now, and it will develop quite a bit afterwards. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The exclusive yeah, So the way peak. we... Yeah, exactly. yeah, basically. Well, the game <laughs> is in early access now, so of course we have a little bit of the beginnings in the game. Um, and the idea right now that we have for the player is um, <clears throat> um, Theodore used to come to the valley as a kid. That's what you already know when you get into it. Um, and he used to come in the summers uh, to the valley as a kid to be with his grandpa and learn survival and 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 and. Uh, forest skills basically and foraging skills from his grandpa um and they used to send each other cassette tapes instead of letters because letters are letters and as a kid he couldn't write yet or read probably um but he could talk so they sent cassette tapes over to each other because phone lines in the valley are non-existent it takes place in uh, in the 80s so phone lines or cell service wasn't a thing back then in the valley anyway um and um so they used to send each other cassette tapes and as the player you can find those cassette tapes by exploring the valley and the pois and um those cassette tapes can then be played uh in radios that you find in various places on the map um and they are basically sort of memory snippets from conversations or or no text messages i guess what you call it nowadays they send to each other um 
and eventually that will be expanded on by letters and articles and maybe newspapers and that sort of things um and also there are voice triggers around in the world when you walk around so um i don't know uh if there is a campsite or campground in the map if you get close to it and you enter a trigger box a voice line will play that suggests that he kind of remembers that there should be a camping ground around somewhere here um and yeah that that's a little bit how we try to get the story across without it having to be linear yeah i love that yeah kind of like you you get rewarded through exploration is sort of what it sounds like to yes. me yeah i love that yeah exactly yeah perfect so well, um, i would also really love to be able to dive into the story of the development of the game itself right because that's really where kind of the beauty of this whole project started um and especially since it's i personally just find it so inspiring it makes me so happy hearing about how this whole thing even came together and i feel like it helps give a lot of context to the game itself for the viewers to understand kind of how this all started. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a funny story, I guess. Um, like I said a little bit about before, um, I started as a content creator and thought I can create a game, as anybody can, if you're willing to put the time and effort in it, of course. Um, and basically i started fiddling with the engine i watched some tutorials um mostly those of the unreal sensei on youtube he's very good free tutorials and very good um for beginners like complete beginners explains stuff in the engine itself then gets into like the basic stuff the the controls in the engine um materials and everything um i really love those and um from there out, like I said, I basically just started with a landscape. Um, while I talk, let me try and find a photo that I found the other day that I showed the guys. Um, and so I started fiddling with the landscape, which basically started the whole thing. And then we were like, OK, this is cool. We have a landscape now. But what now? Right. We need kind of a story or at least something to go along with it. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, it's loading. All right. If you can switch over to my screen, you can see that um, this is uh, a very rough cut of um, the landscape before we actually started coloring it in. So this is just um, a landscape with one layered auto material. Well, it's not even, an, it's just a texture, I think, even at this point. Um, but here you can already see here in the background is El Capitan. And right here um, is, I think they call it Cathedral Rock on top of my mind. I'm not sure. Correct me, chat, if you know it better. Um, and we started working uh, on this. And eventually we, we got to um, um, well, another picture I have um, that is really cool to show. Um, that is the progress picture I had a while ago, or not a while ago. It was basically, um, let's see, it's right here. I should have prepared this, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, right here. I think it was about five, five months later, right? Uh, yeah, here it is. Yes, it was. Oh, that's a small version, this one. So here you see, this was September 1st. The other picture was, I think, from August. Yeah, the 30. <laughs> so the picture I showed before was from the 31st of August and this was um, the 1st of September when I started to use an actual landscape with layers. It's still just a very tile texture, but hey, it is something. And then on May 26, 2022 is the early access release where we got it to this, basically. So that's a very, that's a cool point to see the progress, I guess. Um, and um, so we started just working on we, and the community was very helpful with this. Um, I personally do most of all the in-engine work and the community helped with the story, with voice lines, with um, 
well, if there's any programmers in chat with being my rubber ducky, I could just talk to them and, and vent to them about stuff that didn't work or um, use them as inspiration or whatever. And that's how it is basically became a community project. A lot of people put their time and effort in it. People did research about um, the, the valley and the, the real life location. What what kind of wildlife is there? Uh, what what fauna um, or flora, I should say, fauna is wildlife. Um, but what flora, the plants, and, and of course we took a little bit artistical liberty, I guess it's called. So there is a river there, but it's probably not exactly in the location where it's now. And there is a lake um, that we will probably see later, or we are actually saw it in the trailer. That is not really there, but you know, it's you need to use a little bit artistic liberation, I guess. Um, so the community came together and worked on this, and that is what makes it really special. I mean, like I said, I have a day job in cybersecurity, so I do all of this in my free time, and I really need my community to help me out with, with stuff and being supportive um, as well. Um, yeah, Frost, take over. Tell your side. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we talked a lot about what uh, what could happen with this. You always wanted to make a game and began, we began talking about what type of game backstory of the main character basically changed i think uh a couple of times throughout uh the development of of everything yeah oh there we go <laughs> Internet broken. <laughs> oh, did it cut out? Yeah, there we it did. go. For me, at least. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's back. All right, we're back. Should be good now. <laughs> Can you repeat that? Uh, what part did we hear? Um, basically, that nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were just starting. The back. Oh, okay. Uh, Thurston talked about uh, that he wanted to make a game and a little bit what what genre it would be and what he actually wanted to uh, because he began fiddling with this, um, and then we were a small part of the community that began talking about. Uh, I think it was actually doing gameplay or something uh, when we played games about what it should be about, and I think. Uh, some of the backstory we talked about back then uh, has have changed quite a bit uh, up until now. Um, and that also have been quite fun to see that development of the character and the backstory. So that's also why a lot of things isn't set in stone. And that's a good thing about early access as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the community of the actual players. I mean, um, we have people that are playing the early access version. We have some content creators on YouTube and Twitch that played it. And um, we have, I try when I update the game to have as um, little bugs as possible because we all hate them. And I think I'm doing pretty okay on that. Um, but there is one big bug with sound cutting out with the map. We have a, an in game map. And if you open that, um, apparently four times all the ambient audio just cuts out. I'm still trying to figure that one out. But we actually had somebody in our Discord that was just playing the game who went completely ballistic on the issue, trying to pinpoint it and figure it out. He went completely analytic. And it's so great to, to get that kind of support, especially when you don't, don't really expect it. You know, we, we have a few friends in the community that we also play games with that do play tests. And then there is somebody who just dives into an issue and, and almost creates a complete report of what he finds. It's, it's, it's so amazing to, to, to be a part of that. It's, it's so lovely. Yeah, I think what I love the most about the idea of all of that is that it's not just, 
it's not just like your coworkers or just colleagues and trying to just build this game. It sounds like you're all friends through this development process. You have become friends and now you play games as well outside of just developing this one. And you all come together with new ideas to revamp the story or, uh, you know, upgrade some parts of the graphics, things like that. And I think that is so cool just in and of itself, the way that it has transformed your own little community around this project as well. And it's, yeah. it's all just through, a you know, a combined love of gaming and of wanting to build a game, which is so cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's funny not... that you say that. Yeah, you go for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say it's not only a Thurston's own community, it's also uh, stretching out until uh, out uh, in the Unreal Engine uh, community. Because a lot of times when there had been an issue, people have really been stepping up and to help with anything and comparing notes and whatever. And uh, content creators for uh, different things in the Unreal Engine, they push out one tutorial after another constantly as well uh, with everything they do. So if there's an issue, it can actually be quite hard to find the right solution because there's so much out there. Um, so yeah, uh, it's the good yeah. thing and the bad thing at, at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking like, because I also do content creation or YouTube, I started doing development streams of the game while I'm just working on stuff. And I don't do it a lot because recently before the last update that I pushed out, I was working on a secret new location that people could find. So of course we didn't want to uh, put that in the dev streams, otherwise spoilers everywhere. Um, but before that, I, I did it a lot of times. And actually there was one time where we were just hanging out and there was, I had like, I think eight or 10 people watching. It's not a really big channel that I have, but nonetheless, very great people at that. And at some point I, I, YouTube and Twitch, and I just got raided on Twitch by the Unreal Engine, who was probably just done with another inside Unreal stream or something. And yeah, so many people just dropped in. I, I kind of was flabbergasted at that moment. And a lot of people actually stayed and helped us out with some performance issues and stuff that we had. And I, I think it made the game actually run like 50% better than it did at that moment. And I'm so still so grateful for everybody who hopped in there. And there were a lot of other developers that are working on really cool projects that um, were, were streaming their own game game development as well on Twitch and YouTube. It's so cool to see that. It's, it's such a great community all around. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love hearing that in particular, just because we love being able to raid uh, other developers' streams purely for reasons like that, because it can help connect some of these developers together, they might have answers to questions that come up during the stream. And also, you know, live developing is, as I'm sure you can attest to, extremely intimidating because <laughs> if something goes wrong, you're troubleshooting live in front of however many people are watching. Mm -hmm. And that, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the wrong circumstances, that can feel very daunting and, intimidating and you know it's you don't always like showing that something went wrong and something you're building but it's i love it when stuff like this happens because then you have the community rallying around you and it's no longer just you troubleshooting now it's everyone in the chat is also troubleshooting and oh you should try yeah, this exactly and it might be this feature that came through yeah. and things like that yeah. yeah it's really great i have my fair shares of indeed trying to troubleshoot stuff and the um, occasional frustrations on stream. I'm not going to lie. And it's just so great to have people try to help out. And, and yeah. I said it before, my biggest arch nemesis in the Unreal Engine is collisions. Nine out of 9.9 9 out of 10 times when I have an issue with something not working, it's because of those stupid collisions. I mean, it's so. It, it keeps beating me and it's just so annoying, but 
Yeah, it is. It is part of the process. I mean, I, like I said, I do this as a passion project and a hobby. I'm by no means a professional or, or, or uh, I don't know, an actual... I mean, I'm a game dev because I do it, but I don't have a lot of knowledge. I know everything I know because other people know it. Um, so for me, it's also a learning process and, and the, the learning curve can be quite steep, but that's also kind of what I love about it. I, I love puzzles and figuring stuff out and um, I use only blueprints and that makes it so much easier on one point because it's basically just <laughs> connect the dots, I guess. Um, but it also, yeah, I don't know if it makes it much harder. I don't, I don't, I can't read C++, but, um, yeah, I love that there is an option to use blueprints to make it so accessible for everybody. It's so great. Yeah, absolutely. I know, especially for people like me who <laughs> I cannot code. I mean, let's, I'll, I'll be very frank about that. I, I am an art brain person. I can't do the code, the math, the numbers and letters and things. <laughs> I just look at a color and say that it's pretty and then you know, kind of build off of that, right? So <laughs> being able to have the <laughs> blueprint system to, you know, it, it in cases exactly like this where you wanted to build this game and now you have the full capability to do so, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Know, it makes it makes yeah. I know another yeah, yeah. thing that you had mentioned was that you've used uh quite a bit of marketplace assets in mm -hmm. the creation of yes. the game, right? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that as well? Oh yes, please. Um so that's another great thing, especially for small teams or people that are um doing the, the engine work basically solo is is the marketplace, right? There is so many good assets and high quality assets. Um, I personally love a lot of the modular um, building parts and, and, and sets because um, everybody can have the same pack, but it never has to look the same. Um, and I use a lot of, I, I, I think 90% of the game is Unreal Market assets. Like I said, I do this in my free time and I don't have time to build everything from the ground up. If somebody else invented the wheel, who am I to reinvent it, right? So um, a few a few packs that I really want to call out is uh, Hyper. Hyper is a developer on the marketplace. He has an inventory system, a building system, a farming system, um, a landscape system, choppable trees, mineable rocks. He has a lot, and it's all high quality, high poly um, assets, very photorealistic. Um, and um, yeah, those are really great. Um, next to that, we use Ultra Dynamic Sky, of course, because I mean it's dirt cheap for what it does. It's crazy. I I don't know how Everett, the the developer of it, well, I mean I guess he makes a pretty bug because it sells so well, but he could ask a lot more for it. Is what I'm trying to say. And um, like there is for the wildlife update that I'm working on right now, we use we we need animal models. So um, I use some uh made by nmx i think he's called and we want to use uh, gim uh, gims models um and we are currently in the in in um the how do you say that in in the in the process uh, where we have uh, an indiegogo campaign going um to basically support um those packs because well they are not cheap but they look great so we would love to have them. Um, and since we're all doing this voluntarily, nobody is actually gaining anything from this. Um, so everything that if we get any sales, all the revenue goes straight back into development or assets. Um, and so we have an Indiegogo campaign going right now. Um, and we use the slogan for it, immortalize your pet in your 71st Ranger. Um, and basically what we try to do there is um, from a few uh, a few tiers have the possibility for the backers to um, upload a picture or several pictures of their pets or send them over to us. Um, and we can put them in the game as a picture in like one of the cabins or uh, on missing posters or whatever. We can always talk about what people want. Um, and um, 
they also get a game key with that, of course. Um, and it's it's actually funny. We had the first day we launched the campaign. There was somebody who messaged me on Discord. It was like, hey, dude, um, I really would love to support to this. My uh, my dog just died, and and I would love to have this opportunity uh, to to get him in there and to well, basically immortalize him. And yeah, that's so heartwarming when people actually feel a value to that, right? I mean. Yeah, it, it's just great to be able to do something like that. And and we kind of both benefit of that, right? I guess. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what we're um, what we're doing right now. And um, yeah. Uh, I know that I personally am going to have to be digging into that because I have uh, I have two <laughs> dogs. I don't think I've ever actually mentioned this on stream before, but I have two dogs. Uh, one Here's of the them scoop, guys. is. <laughs> I know we're we're gonna get to it. One is a gigantic uh, border collie mix, and then the other one is this tiny little runt of a beagle. And honestly, I think the beagle should be a boss of some kind <laughs> because <laughs> she's terrifying. <laughs> oh. oh, that's great! Nice. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if we if we can get the page on screen because there's actually a picture there of me and my moop which is my French bulldog puppy, or she's not really a puppy anymore. She's become pretty big. Um, and um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's her. So, um, and in the bottom of the page, there is a few examples of uh, Moop, who is currently in the, in the, um, uh, uh, in the cabin as uh, in picture frames. Yeah, and those are the animals who want to put in there. Um, and yeah, there you go. So there are currently two picture frames in, in the cabin that you saw in the trailer and Moop is in there. And so something like this is possible for the backers to get as well. And um, yeah, we we would love to to give you guys the opportunity to get into that. And we would love for you to help us uh, give you guys the best experience we possibly can. Um, so yeah, and that's so that's why the marketplace is so important, right? If you want high-end animals and you got you have to get somebody to model them and animate them and I mean, I don't even want to think about what that can cost if you have to hire somebody to do that. And right now on the marketplace you can get pretty high quality animals included with animations for a very reasonable price. So yeah, that it's it's amazing. But that also touches another subject that we have talked a lot about inside the uh, inside of community and that's basically placeholders thurston was against yeah. it in the beginning but it's important to also see your own uh, progress um some of them were necessary and if you think that the asset that you actually want and you don't know how to do it on your own and you want to buy something better don't think you have to do it straight away because a placeholder can be just as good uh, for you to visualize it. So if you can get, either get one of the free ones or one of the cheaper ones, and then wait until um, the other one, you have the uh, capital for buying the other one. Uh, it's, it's just as good because you can see the progress that you're doing and you don't get like run down because, oh, I don't get anywhere. Uh, so don't be afraid to use placeholders. Um, we had done it with audio, uh, animals, and <laughs> cabins, and other things, basically. That's, that's uh, actually a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have uh, we have a yeah. few deer in the game currently, and I, I if a content creator plays our game, I try to be there when if they stream it live. I try to be there in chat so I can either help them out or just see their live reactions and. If it's during a time where I can't watch, I always try to chase down the VOD to watch it, uh, to rewatch it or watch it back. And there in our current game, there are a few what I call stupid deer or dumb deers. Um, and they are basically <laughs> just deers that have only the most simple code to roam to a random location in their nav mesh, I think. And 
that's all they do. They have no interaction with the player. They they don't have to eat. They don't have a health system. They have nothing else. They just walk around. And so everybody who I watch play the game, they just see the deer and like, oh, hey, a deer. They walk up to it and they just try to interact with it, but nothing happens. The thing just stands there and pushes you out of the way. And well, <laughs> Simon he was doing a play test at one point and he basically just jumped on the back of one of the deer and... Placeholders and because of the things. collision bush, box, I jumped way higher yeah. than I normally could. <laughs> there it is, uh, collision once again. Yeah. <laughs> the nemesis. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah, a good... I love oh. tiny things like that. It really adds yeah. <laughs> some some fun stories for when it's complete and uh, your deer no longer rockets you into space. You know, it's a little bittersweet, but <laughs> it's a fond memory then, right? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that we also have some stuff in the game itself that you're wanting to show off, right? Did we want to jump into some of that? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Um... I don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> so let's first take a very far away look at the map. Bear with me, guys, because this is going to have some lag in here because, well, because. Um, okay, we are in, in game view. Uh, okay, there you go. Oh, it's not too bad, actually. Okay. So one funny thing that I want to mention is this map right now is what we currently have. and the this is <laughs> so i started this project in the very very early stages in like the very first available technical preview of unreal engine 5 and um because before that i always wanted to do unreal engine and stuff but i was really um pushed aside by the whole you have to bake your lighting kind of thing and I just wanted to basically see my results right away without having the performance uh, issues. Um, and that's where Lumen comes in right now and makes everything beautiful. Um, and I, the part here in the middle, which is our current playable map, well, you can kind of see the trees in there. That's the playable area. But this whole landscape block is like, I think, well, what should we say for us? Like 10%? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Of the full map. And per yeah, of the full area that we had in mind at the beginning. <laughs> and um, we were talking the other day, and I tried right in the beginning to, when uh, World Partition became a thing and was getting more and more stable, I tried to convert the map to, because it was one huge landscape, right? So the, the performance was insufferable. And um, so eventually I just cut this part out with the landscape tool and it hurt me really hard because when we when I imported the height map, I had to go with the smoothing tool over every single, well, I guess you call it an inch, I call it a centimeter, but over every single like part, every pixel had to be smoothed out by hand. So this is 10% of everything I had to smooth out by hand. So it hurt me so much to have to cut everything away. I still have it in a backup uh, project. And then I started to try and convert it into word partition. And I thought it didn't work and it broke something because I just ended up with an empty level. And I was like, well, that was great. Everything is gone. Later, like three days ago, I tried it again with a tutorial which basically told me that when it's done, you have a new level in your content browser with a, a suffix of WP and you had to open that. At that moment, I was like, maybe it worked before <laughs> and I just didn't know. And no. <laughs> you know, that's also the learning curve and everything that comes along with it. Yeah. So if there's any of you people in chat right now that know or have some kind of knowledge of how to get a cut out of the other part, push it around this and convert the whole thing to world partition, please hit me up on Discord because we love to get your help. 
Um, so this is right now the current playable area. Yeah. And um, yeah, there was a funny little side note that kind of really broke me, especially because Frost, Frost Simon really pushed me to go with the world the partition world. right yeah. away and try it harder. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, but we need to continue. We need to keep on going. And yeah, I just wanted to say... see results and not yeah. <laughs> do anything uh, over at that point because he mm -hmm. had basically worked a, a long time on it so far. So he didn't want to go back and have oh, to start yeah. over That's... because then he felt like he didn't do any progress. And yeah, yeah but because at that point I thought I had on? to re import the height map, do world partition, and yeah. then smooth everything over again. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't <laughs> exactly. But uh, at the stage where yeah. he is now, if he's going to do the same thing now, uh, now he has a lot of the other codes in there, and basically it would be a such bigger uh, project now than it was back then. That's also why I pushed and pushed and pushed, but no, I'm that was one of the SOB. things Thurston was stand fast on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's the yeah that's kind of the funny thing. Like, and now we have like so this landscape is already edited a lot from the original, of course, as you can see. Like I said before, the lake here in the middle is not there in in the real life location. And over here is a very windy path that I had to, that I tried to create with splines, uh, like with um, uh, landscape splines, I think it's called. And it was such a pain to get it not to deform in ways it shouldn't. Yeah. That I was like, if I have to do this again, I think I'll just quit. And I didn't want to do that. So yeah, I had to be stubborn for a bit. Um, yeah, that yeah, so this is took quite a while. Yeah, it did. It did. So this is basically only 10% of what we want to be able to use in the full project or in the full release, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, uh, we can't right now. So hit me up. Um, <laughs> um, and this is the valley that, that currently the game takes place in. So you have your El Capitan over there and your Cathedral Rock over here. Um, I'm sorry if anybody gets kind of seasick or motion sickness from all my swerving. Please tell me and I'll stop. But um, <laughs> so, oh, and that's too far. Eh, I have to slow my camera down a bit. But um, yeah, this is kind of where we took the picture before that I showed you guys um, somewhere over here, I guess. And um, yeah, it's it's just really amazing to see all that progress. And we already have new rivers and everything. Um, um and yeah i don't know it's just it's it's oh and it's a weird kind of processing volume um <laughs> and this is basically the 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 cabin where you start currently you can see i'm working on some wildlife we have a gray fox here and a deer that we're not going to use um <laughs> but i just had to put it in there for testing and placeholders <laughs> um placeholders and yeah and so another great thing that I love about the marketplace is the um, mega scans. Of course, everybody loves those. So Quixel mega scans. These three, this three right here, the big one is um, the. Um, uh, I think they're called the block black alder three pack from mega scans. I was so happy when that came out. It had so much potential and. Right now, it still does. We I have been working together with someone uh, in the uh, Ultra Dynamic Sky community, and he helped me create something really cool that was a thing that I felt we really needed to put in here, even though it's well, I guess it's an important detail. At least I feel like it is. Let me try and see how I change this. It's here, I think. Oh, it is here. Mm, yeah, here it is. And then I put this to 98. No, wait, let's first go to, um, I don't know, three. Oh, three. There we go. And then over here. So we basically changed the uh, a few material um, uh, functions. And I am by no means, I, I, I don't like them because I don't understand them. And that's why I don't like them. So I'm a little biased. 
um, but we, um, well, he changed some of the material functions and um, some notes and stuff. And the global oilage actor that came with the um, uh, mega scan trees, so that now with ultra dynamic sky, we can basically change the leaves depending on the season. So right now, I think it's somewhere close to spring, as I've said it. And if I changed it to um, 30 days per, se per season, I've set it to. So if I change to 35 or something, then I think it should be somewhere around summer. And well, you don't really see it well right now, but they are, should, they are a little bit deeper green. So in the, in the spring, they're a little bit more towards yellow, light green. Then in the summer, they become dark green. And in autumn, as you just saw, they, um, I lost my thing here. They become kind of. Um, oh wait, I think I did that wrong. By the way, um, that doesn't really matter. Um, so in autumn they become. Uh, yeah. So right now it's between summer and autumn, so they start changing a little bit in color, and then uh, towards later autumn, they um, become more red-ish. Because I love that color. I love red leaves. And then towards the end of autumn or fall, whatever you call it. Um, let me see. I think 88 should work. Yeah, they changed ultra dynamic scale. Yeah, so now they turn brown. And then when it's actually winter. And that's what I love about these trees, right? But you have to change something in the material function to actually swap materials. They are just branches. I love it. I'm sorry. I just love it. <laughs> and then if it actually oh, snows, all the wonderful. snow just stays on the branches. Yeah. It's it's so cool. But that is also one of the good things about this because you don't notice if it's there really uh, when you're playing the game. But if it isn't there uh, as a player, you sometimes think, oh, why is this still so bright green? Yeah, there might be. Um, snow on it but why but this yeah, way exactly. it looks more natural uh, yeah exactly yeah and i agree i think that's a actually a really great point of just development in general where yeah if it's if it's done well and implemented well then nobody will notice it it just feels like exactly you're in the world you're immersed in it it makes sense it's yes, when something exactly is wrong they notice everything else <laughs> so you notice yeah. it yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah like that... i use riverology for the rivers here and sometimes i have changed their values and their variables but somehow they reset itself and then they become very wavy here and they shouldn't and Probably if I just hit enter, they calm down right away. No, they do not. Hmm. That's funny. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So now they are way calm. And then I change it back to one and it's calm again. It's it's weird. But that's also like, the, whoa, what's going Did I break something? <laughs> it was unhappy oh. with your river decisions. <laughs> I guess. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but right here, something is, well, I, I, I'm afraid now to move the camera too much. <laughs> but there is a river right here that somehow also kind of broke and there is like dry land in between. And that is something that one of the content creators noticed right away, which I get. And it's it's not supposed to be like this, but that's one of those details that like with the trees, I've rarely heard anybody talk about that. But this is something you notice right away if it's not correct. So yeah, it's kind of it's it's funny. It's it's cool how that works. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Let's. There is there are so the many little now. things like that too. Uh, where besides just visually, I've also noticed that through audio too. Audio is a huge giveaway of if something is working. You don't notice it at all, but if something is missing or incorrect, that's where yeah. something in our brains is just like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny that you say that. I um I watch a lot of um uh, Les Stroud, the Survivor Man. He has uh, all of his shows on. Uh, he has Discovery Channel shows and everything, and he has them on YouTube right now as well. And he is also a movie or TV series producer, and he actually says that you can have very bad video quality, um, but as long as you have good audio quality, it it's not too bad. But as soon as you have bad audio quality and super high end, like if you have 4K resolution, but your audio sounds like you're inside an AC unit, nobody watches it anymore. It's that's really something that you never actually think about. But just think mm-hmm. about yourself. I mean, there's probably a lot of people in chat right now that try to watch some tutorials on Unreal and they come across somebody who is uh, going like, <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> You know, it doesn't work. You know, it it just doesn't. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That I feel personally attacked by that one, just because that is what my headset's quality is. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know well, one of my right favorite now. examples. Yeah, well, because I'm on the good mic when it's ah. my headset, it's a, <laughs> it's a whole other ballpark there. But <laughs> I know oh, there yeah. was a game that I was playing recently uh, with an example of audio where all of it was amazing. The visuals are amazing. All of the sounds were great, but there was something that kept bothering me and I couldn't tell what it was for a long time. I was just going uh in and out the the whole setting of it is you're inside of a building so there's a lot of doors Mm -hmm. and when i was going in and out of the doors for all these rooms i was always like you know what there's just something about this is really bothering me and i finally realized it's because there was no sound for when any of the doors opened or closed and it was Uh, just one tiny little detail like that where when there's not a click of it latching or even just a subtle squeak of it opening or something like that, my brain was like, I love everything about it, but I am also so bothered. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That can also be hard for them, uh, the developer of that thing, because too much will also discourage people. If every Mm -hmm. time, like you say, you're walking down a hallway and you have to open all these doors, if it's a major thing every time you do it, it's not going to happen as well. People will leave the game quickly as well. So it's yeah. a double-sided coin. Yeah, yeah, and that's also Absolutely. something that I really, really experienced using the Unreal Engine is the the whole sound thing about the game development is such a whole different profession, basically. There are so many things that you can do, and I've only scratched, well, not even the surface, I think. I I think I kind of got it down to audio, to sound cues and sound classes, and I, I, um, I bought a um, menu system that uses sound classes to um, have vol- volume sliders in in their uh, settings. So at that point, I had to start uh, getting into that, and it's really hard to get everything leveled out correctly, and. Like you said, with those doors, if they are too loud and there are too many of them, it's going to be bothering. But there's also the thing of um, variation, right? If you have the same sound for every door, you're not going to play it for very long. And that's the same with footsteps, for example. It's such a small, stupid thing, actually, but it's missing if it's not there. (laughs) We were playing Ghost Recon Wildlands the other day, and somehow my character glitched, and everywhere he walked, it sounded like he was on some sort of metal planes or something. And <laughs> he was walking in the desert and just was like, dunk, 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 dunk. It, yeah, it's something so, so, <laughs> so small, but it's, yeah, you notice it right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's also the why the audio issue that, we have with the map and and stuff like that when you go in and out the map and that the audio suddenly disappears people within 20 seconds of it happening people are like something is wrong and then it mm-hmm. takes another 10 seconds for them to realize it's because there's no audio yeah. uh, and it's only even the though that is, audio 
actually yeah. because voice cues and everything still work so that's why it's actually very weird because people usually open the map when they're just coming or going from a poi and a lot of pois have trigger boxes for audio cues right so people are just opening the map and the map also has audio cues when you hover over pois and he tells something about that place what he remembers or something right so they close the map and suddenly they're like wait all my sound is gone. And then they walk around and another audio box triggers and they're like, huh? So it's, yeah. Yeah, stupid. but the jump, uh, <laughs> the jump grunt is still there as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's people not ambient, don't notice it? Is... No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> when you walk and you jump and stuff like that, uh, you still hear some of it, but not all. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It takes a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I think it seems like we may have figured out what was going on with this green chair on our end. If we want to uh, jump back in there to show off some more of the map that you were talking about. Yeah, nice. sure. Um, yeah, so let me, while we were just talking about the map, I can show the map real quick. Um, it might give away some POIs, maybe, but on the other hand, you can find the map in game at various locations. So why the heck not? Um, so currently, this is the map that we're going th uh, with. And it's a funny thing because everybody gets um, basically disorientated by this map. And I think <laughs> it's very funny to watch. Um, and when people notice it, it's, it's, it, it works. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, Tina, but... <laughs> The compass is turned. That would have thrown me for a loop no, at first. For sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that happens to everybody. And the reason is uh, because of the aspect ratio and the actual true north of the real life location. So right here, this is El Capitan that we saw earlier. And on this side of the map, on the right hand side of the map is where the actual north in the real life location is. That's why I rotated the wind or what do you call it the uh, rose i guess yeah the mm -hmm. compass thing on the map compass um, and yeah thank you and, and and it throws people off because everybody thinks when they look at a map that north is just the top of the map and it makes sense but how am i going to put a widescreen map on a portrait modus right i it looks not good i mean i could put in scrolling and I am going to look into a map system for when we actually are going to expand the map because then we need more space. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it is what it is for now. And the funny thing is, if you find the map in the game, so first, if you just walk around and you press M for map, you get a voice line like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, it seems so much bigger than when I was younger or whatever. Or it's a cooler voice line than I bring it across. Just, play the game <laughs> but um <laughs> so he, he throws a voice line which um basically hints to the player that you can f that you can and should find a map to find your way around the valley and once you find it you can in game or now in the widget editor so it doesn't work but if you hover over the different uh icons the the pois ex uh, a voice line plays um that will tell something about the location and something that the character remembers from when he was younger. Um, so yeah, that's something I thought was really cool to have sort of an interactive map within the game. But somehow it also breaks the audio of the game, sadly. So yeah, I might have to think of something else. But yeah, I thought it was a cool thing. <laughs> yeah, um, I like that. Because then it, that it feels feature... more like it's part of the world. Yeah, right? Yeah. But that feature is also one of the ones that uh, some of the game testers actually got frustrated about quickly because it was every time they hovered over it. So every time they opened the, uh, they, yeah, put the marker over one of the POIs, it began the voice uh, activation. And that got really frustrating when they basically just looked around and uh, it jumped from one to another. And yeah, so, so some people, like with the doors, that if it's the same sound that comes every time, uh, people get frustrated about it. 
So there needs to yeah. be variations. Or yeah, so the thing with that of is... not doing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's basically two voice lines or more per uh, point of interest. One, one, the first one is a little bit longer, and I think that's where the problem is right now. I will get a little bit into the spaghetti here. Um, and <laughs> there's probably people in chat right now with more experience that are just face palming so hard right now. Um, <laughs> But the way we use it right now is um, basically if you hover over, so the the sounds are all loaded in when you open the map, and then uh, they are set to pause. And then when you hover over the um, location, it plays the audio, and on on hover it pauses it again. So when you hover back on it, it continues where it stopped. Otherwise, it has to start over every time, and that can also be annoying. So I thought this was a good way to go about it. On second hand, it might not be. So maybe I'll just change it to clicks and then play the audio sound or something. I don't know, but, you know, it's a trial. And, it's early access. It's a trial and error process. We're awaiting feedback, and yeah. But I feel like the loading of all these audio files might be some I've heard some people use the term garbage collection um, as a possible issue. I have no idea. I haven't looked into garbage collection or what that may, might be enough to have a verdict on that. But I feel like that might be one of the issues. Um, but um, yeah, I feel like loading in all the audios and then closing out of the um, map might break something. I, I don't know. But it's it's a yeah. it's an almost game breaking experience. Luckily, if you but load the into the main menu and load back into the game, it's all fixed. But yeah, yeah. it's something that I'm sort of a mystery. Another right thing about <laughs> the audio issue is also um, that uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, it wasn't like that from the beginning. It came later on. Uh, I did some of the gameplay uh, testing. Uh, well, I've done it from the very first time it got out and the first uh, version we have out had out. Um, and I never experienced it until I went into my local files and deleted some of my earlier save games. Then after that, I got the same issue. But before that, I didn't have it. So I was like, what are you talking about? It never happens to me. But after that, it happened all the time. So it's it's an issue yeah. that suddenly came uh, for some reason. <clears throat> and that's uh, the funny so, thing. I cannot for the life of me connect it to the safe system. But, yeah, you know, if everybody <laughs> has some kind of bug report like that, I'm like, eh, I just don't know. <laughs> so I'm still yeah. kind of, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's the only bug that really bugs me. <laughs> And I'm kind of procrastinating on looking into it and pushing it forward because it's it breaks my mind and it breaks my motivation. So yeah, I just try to work on other cool stuff. And I know that bug fixing is very important to do, but yeah, it it I I just can't find what it is. So it really demotivates me from working on anything else. And then I'd rather just work on more content that yeah might be. Also enjoyable. Yeah. But that's but also one of the only bugs speaking. that you haven't in the end gotten to fix of yeah. the ones that's come back to us. Yeah. So Yeah, and that's another thing, right? Because I, I try to watch a lot of the content creators, they um they point things out as they go. So for example, we had at one point um a lot of people were having trouble with um the temperature in the game, the temperature management basically. So um, it can get very cold, and I mean, to be fair, we start you out in late fall, so it's gonna become cold and becoming winter soon. Um, mm -hmm. And when the character is cold, the food bar and stamina and fatigue bar drain faster. So you can find food everywhere by foraging, but you just have to look for it. So a lot of people are kind of you start in this area and. If you go up the stairs here and you just walk down the path, there is a lot of forage bulls. And but 
almost all players that I've seen are kind of afraid to take that leap. And so we really want, I wanted to do something with that feedback. So that's why we uh, placed these kind of crop plots here or plant, yeah, I don't know, garden plots, I Planter guess. Boxes. Um, yeah, plants. Thank you. Thank you. Words are hard. Um, <laughs> so we also included a little tutorial because some people couldn't really, um, the, the cooking was not as intuitive as I thought it was. So we put in a little tutorial thing with for the cooking. And with that came these planter boxes that um, gives them a start with resources, but also with the tutorial makes them cook some food so they have something to go on. So that is one of the things with the feedback from the community that I try to find a creative way to solve. And mm -hmm. there were a lot of other stupid things that people come across. We had um, cans with food in, in certain POIs that you could find and you could eat them, but somehow the UI told people that they need to have cooking level four to be able to use them. So everybody just held those things in their uh, inventory without trying it, which makes sense. But those are some, some of the smaller things that um, I try to immediately fix and push to Steam if I can, um, because it's just really important. And that's why I also, it's, I love watching other content creators play the game because it's just fun to see their reaction, but it's also great live feedback for what yeah. needs fixing. Yeah. Right. That is actually, yeah, I in think general, always... a good thing. Oh, no, go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, yeah. Um, we have gotten a lot of feedback, like Thurston said, and the thing about being in a dev community and then watch a game, uh, a streamer basically uh, play the game that you are and give you uh, feedback. It's not only the gamer that gives you feedback, it's the whole community uh, from that gamer as well, because some of them are in the chat uh, asking about things. Are you going to do this and that? Uh, have you thought about doing it this way instead? And all those things. So either be in chat or being um, on voice chat uh, together with the, um, the streamer when he's playing it uh, is a really good thing. Yeah. What yeah. developer to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And also recordings, right? So when I'm watching something and people point something out in their stream or their recording or, or video, I, I always have my notepads. I mean... <laughs> Right now it's it's quite tame. I, I used to have like a whole bunch of notes everywhere scattered around my desk. I have ADHD, so organizing is horrible with me, but I try. Um, <laughs> and so I always have my notepad here. So if I'm watching someone and they point something out, they scribble it down and I basically make a to-do list. Guys, you won't believe me if my mother or my sister is watching. They're not going to believe me if I say this. I've never been this organized in my life. <laughs> okay, with lists and to dos, and it's never been a thing for me. Um, but somehow with this, it works. I guess if you love it, you can, or something. I don't know. Um, but that's the thing that I that's yeah, yeah, right. I mean, but um, it's it's important for me to to give back as soon as I can to the community. Um, especially if 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 content creators take the time to play it, I know as being a content creator that um, it takes a lot of time and effort and it's not just playing games and recording it that uh, makes fun but um, it's actually quite hard work and uh, I am very close friends with Raptor uh, on, on YouTube um, he, he has recently hit 1 million uh, subscribers and I do a lot for him behind the scenes and I know how hard work it is if you're a bigger content creator that basically lives off of being a content creator. And so he covered our game. Uh, game Edge did a few videos on it. Ken Zalone and a few other um, well, pretty cool YouTubers and Twitch streamers uh, played it. And it's really, it's also just fun to watch it. And then when somebody plays it, they're like, oh, Thurston, you, um, <laughs> you uh, screwed up here. You need to fix this. And then I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's really it's it's good to have that direct feedback, and yeah, it, yeah I I love that. Yeah, yeah. It also, it, some people are also discouraged about writing a long, uh, positive thing, uh, if they are doing uh, some sort of feedback on it. A lot of people only do the all the negative things if they do, and some of that can get quite tainted uh, for your experience then but being there and watching them how they actually uh, see the game live or how they play it and what they feel when they play it it's more genuine yeah and you get both the positive and the negative uh, because Mm -hmm, if they're going to write a long letter to you they're not going to put that many of the positive things they would have said if it were a live stream yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I never thought of it that way, but I can absolutely see that because I know when it comes to reviews and any kind of feedback, for the most part, yeah. the unless there's something that very strongly affected you one way or the other, you're not going to write about it, even if it was impactful in the moment. Uh, you know, exactly. the thing that they're going to write about, of course, is, oh, there was this bug and this other thing happened. Yeah. Um, when in and the moment they may have thought, "Wow, that is that is a superb tree. That tree is fantastic," yeah. <laughs> but they might not write that, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very true. Um, and the it's it's just very cool. I mean, uh, from a content creator perspective, I'm I started with my channel also in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 i think march 2020 is when i uploaded one of my first videos so i haven't been on youtube that long and i grew quite fast in the beginning of course now it goes a whole lot slower because there's way less content but um for any one tip i can give any indie developer or triple a developer that is in the uh that is watching right now use your content creators while you can there are so many game developers and and bigger studios and publishers that um uh, distribute their keys only to bigger channels and and the more famous guys that there is one thing that is very important and i think that a lot of viewers of youtube agree with me on that as well as a lot of the content creators out there um so many developers only think about the bigger channels because they might have a bigger reach um but there is a very important thing that you all might be missing and that is one that they have way less time to cover your game unless it's really good and and has some sort of special niche of course um but a lot of the bigger channels have very little time because they get so many offers to play games um and two is that they might not always be 100% genuine because they know what their viewers like and they play into that. If you go for smaller channels, they might have a smaller reach um, with the amount of people that watch, but you get a way more genuine review of your game and you get a way more time on your game as well. And that is something that I think is way more important if you're a developer than that it is um, of a big YouTuber or content creator that just covers 10 minutes of your game and gets a million views. I mean, yes, you have a million views, but did you really get your game across? I don't know. Um, that Yeah, that's yeah. something I feel very strongly about as a content creator as well as um, now a game developer because now I have seen both sides and I really try to... Um, focus also on the smaller content creators because I think they deserve a chance to get fun games. And also because I know how hard it is as a smaller content creator to actually get access to games. So yeah, that's a great tip I can give you guys. Example of that, also uh, referring to what we talked about before uh, the stream with with some of the bigger channels might have uh, a little bit of a toxic side to it. Uh, when it comes to their community, uh, where people can be on really far ends of of it all, uh, we were um, 
in during a live performance of one of the content creators that has about, I think, uh, just short of 20,000 uh, followers or something. And because uh, his community and the way they interacted with him, uh, they basically came up with a lot of suggestions for uh, improving the game. And his back and forth with them, uh, Thurston gave out uh, a key for uh, the content creator and a key that he could give away uh, in any way he saw fit. And we actually ended up giving them more keys because of the yeah. support that there were in that community. So we would never have done that if it were a bigger channel or, or something, because we wouldn't get the same back and forth between the creator and the community. Uh, everybody yeah. seems to have fun with it, and they were truly honest about everything they, they found, um, both the positive and the negative side of it. And people disagreed about things, and they disagreed in a good way because it was a small, tighter, uh, basically tight with community. So it wasn't people trying to just get get out there because it's some big YouTuber or Twitch streamer uh, that has millions of followers. Where uh, oh my, my chat got uh, got on there on on a live. Uh, Live performance yeah uh, so Shout yeah out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah exactly yeah and that's true actually it's really funny that you say that because with the wildlife update that i'm currently working on i um didn't want to include active hunting as much um we do have bow and arrow but there will not be a hunting rifles or guns because um well it's not that i'm opposed of them or whatever but it didn't it's not like fitting it the, story. In the story yeah exactly it didn't fit in the story because he's a forest ranger he loves wildlife he loves everything nature and then you're not just gonna actively kill stuff because it's fun or something i don't know it didn't fit into what i felt was in the story so i was thinking of a way of um how we could get rid of the predator animals that are of course also there because they might come and attack you or defend their uh, territory or whatever and i was talking with one of the content creators in their live chat while they were playing it and um i was still contemplating on what we could do with it and somebody in their chat said what about a tranquilizer gun and i was like holy bleep that is really smart I didn't even think of that. And that is something that is very viable. And that is something that a park ranger might easily have access to, I think. So right now I've actually also worked in a flare gun that um, if animals come close to you, you can shoot a flare towards them and it scares them off and they start, uh, they disengage their behavior and they flee away. And I also want to look into implementing a a uh, tranquilizer gun that when you shoot a dart or whatever is going to be as a cartridge in there um that they fall asleep and then you can just go away or whatever you want to do with it um but that was one of the suggestions from a viewer who was watching the content creator and that is also something that i now take as a very very realistic possibility and and thing that's going to be in the game so we're also very open to suggestions from other people that play and watch the gameplay. Um, and I guess that is what, what being a community game developer, development process, or whatever you want to call it, I think that's what, what it's all about with the community. In taking the suggestions in, um, using them or twisting them so they fit into the, the setting. And yeah, I think that's a very important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not be too narrow minded when when suggestions come in and not be too set in your own way. Uh not thinking mm -hmm. of anything special, Thurston. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's not it's under it's a week ago that moment. Thurston Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's under a week ago when Thurston came in in chat and uh, we were talking about uh, a few things oh, and no, he was we go. working on. 
<laughs> he was working on implementing the animals. And basically, he was so set in his mind that this is here is how I'm going to do it. And I want this and this and this, but I can't get it to work. And I'm stuck with this as it is now. And, and we tried, so we were a couple of us was in there and we tried to suggest things, ways he could do it. And at the in the end, I basically told him, uh, Thurston, it seems to me that you didn't come in here for advice. You came in here for permission to actually do it this screwed up way, but it isn't working for you. <laughs> and I was like, you actually maybe we said can it way halfway. better. Yeah, I did. You said it way better. <laughs> you said like you, it feels like you're trying to convince us to give you permission to do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was so yeah. stuck in the way he was thinking that this here is how I'm supposed to do it. I'm not going to do the other things before I have this done. And it's like, but Thurston, they said you have to change some of it anyway because he wanted to do the blueprint for one full animal and then put in the other skins on top of that blueprint. But there's going to be changes in those blueprints anyway. So why not focus on each of them already now but only one of each animal because each animal are going to contain a small animal a grown-up uh, adult and yeah uh, multiple uh, versions of that animal so why not focus on one of the animals uh, at the same time then you do both uh, stick to yeah. your own mindset and also implement a way to go forward from that point you are in that right now and that will help you out and we didn't see him for the next two days because he ended up doing it that like that <laughs> and that guys is why you need a community around you <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna especially say, if you're actually, developing uh... your site my own yeah and yeah. that is that is the thing like we like like I said before, I am doing all the stuff inside the engine. We are also, quote unquote, self-publishing our game. Um, so if there's any publishers watching with a good deal, hit me up. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but so the thing is, I try to make it as efficient as I can with the knowledge I currently have. So with that said, I am a hardcore lover of um, the parent blueprint class and a child blueprint class when I can. So for example, uh, I use also the animal behavior kit, a very great pack for your wildlife in your game. Um, <clears throat> let me see, let me use the gray fox as an example, I guess. So uh, right here, there is a blueprint prey fox gray. That's what it's called. It's just a gray fox. Um, which is a child of um, the main uh, prey AI class in uh, Animal Behavior Kit, and then we have um, a female, a female young, a male, and a male young, and they are all then derived as a child of the first one. That way, if I want to change something generic for all of them, like um, I don't know what was something I changed lately. Um, I think it was something with uh, their behavior, like what will they attack and what will they not attack? What will they flee from? Uh, and that should be the same for all four of them. Um, and uh, maybe something with how they attack or something, you know, their, their uh, animations or um, well, whatever you can think of. Something that just covers all four of them. I have to only change that in here. and. Anything I changed separately in their own classes, like for example, um, the female has of course a female component to it somewhere, uh, a variable that's set somewhere. Um, the young ones are scaled down because we don't have a different model for these ones, um, but they are scaled down and they have less HP than the full grown version and stuff. And the the, the the thing that I love about the blueprint classes and how everything derives, and it's probably the same in C++, but I don't know that, so I have no idea. Um, but is that if I change something in the female young one, that stays what it is, even though I change the parent class. But anything that is 
inherited from the parent class that will also change along in the child classes. And that is a, for me, a very quick and, oh, there we go again. Uh, and that for me is a very quick and um, uh, efficient way to work on stuff while I'm doing this by myself, basically, in the engine. And I think that is what you guys were trying to get my mind on, right, Frost? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So the fun thing is I have a little bit of knowledge about how stuff in the engine works. And they, my community are basically just all very smart people that can think logically and they come with ideas. And then I translate that into something that works inside the engine. And that is what I love about having the community and the back and forth with the guys and the girls in the community, because they give me an idea that I can then use and work into something workable. Yeah. yeah. So th that's, yeah, I love that. That's really good. For, oh, for example, the, um, the fleeing with the flare. So there is a projectile. And if there is an overlap with two trigger boxes, <laughs> collisions, um, if there is an <laughs> overlap somewhere with the, a flare and the animal, I just feel like every animal would flee from a very bright flare that gets shot right in front of them. So that's something that I changed in their very top uh, parent class that goes over all of the animals. So then you only have to add that code in one place and everybody just benefits from that. And yeah, that's mm -hmm. trying to be efficient and fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am kind of trying. We we've talked before about the spaghetti. I'm trying to think where my worst spaghetti is. Um. <laughs> worst, uh. worst? How? Like most uh, visually concerning to look at, or <laughs> yes. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of it. I I have a few things that I've worked on, especially when I'm troubleshooting, I'm adding notes here and deleting them there. And then I leave something in there as a reference because then I can fall back to it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it. yeah. <laughs> creative process. I guess my, my, my main character might be a very good example of that. Let's see, where is he in here? Uh, blueprints and then we have the main character and then i have a child of that for the whole wildlife thing where all the um animal behavior kit is included in so mm -hmm. we can have that separate why i don't know but we have um oh yeah here this is well it's not that horrible well okay maybe it is but i don't know you, you guys probably have seen worse um so this is this is what I was trying to create for the horse riding. Um yeah, I <laughs> I don't know if you guys want me to go into it, but it basically is um I used the horse starting starter kit that was free uh for, for the month of what was it? August, I think, or maybe July. Um they had this horse riding kit that was free and I've had my eyes on that for a long while and so I was really glad that it became available. Um and I created a duplicate of the ones that were in there. And this is all the code that they already kind of had. And then I added some more spaghetti here to integrate the mounting on the horse. Now, this was something that I also struggled with for a long time. So here, back in the main character, um, I basically, for now, it's just a overlap with a component on the horse. So the horse right here um, has two trigger boxes on the sides. And that's the how it is uh, in the horse starter kit. So if you step into these boxes and you press the action button, which in our case is E, um, you mount the horse. But for my, for me, the problem was that I wanted the, so how they do it is they have a character like you see right now, which is just a skeletal mesh on top of the horse. And basically that one has all the animations in it for mounting and dismounting the horse. And um, it was just hidden when the horse was just standing there. And upon interaction, your uh, current player pawn get destroyed. and then. Um, 
the character on the horse um, becomes visible or unhidden or whatever, and does the animation of mounting the horse. The problem is with destroying your current player pawn or character is that all the um, stats and health and everything gets, and the inventory gets destroyed along with it. And that's not something I can have because I kind of need that. Then I started to think like, okay, I need to find a way to get this character connected to the horse or have everything going and basically just hide my character. And I've, I have been trying a few renditions and right now I'm basically just attaching the character to the horse. Um, and then the character stays alive and then I possess the horse as a character. So I can ride the horse um, and the horse is also a player pawn. So I just ride the horse and the character is using the animation set that came with the horse for the rider. So I retargeted the animations that the skeletal mesh with the horse had, which was, which was just a UE4 mannequin before. Um, and I kind of retargeted the animations so my guy could use them. And now they just all come along. And that works really well um, up until a certain point um, because it's still not really smooth. But the, the biggest problem for me, and I think, again, it was collision related, of course, because what else can it be, um, was getting the character to the correct position on top of the horse. Um, because I tried to use the um, attach actor to component and attach actor to actor, and then you have um, all the fun, uh, the fun rules like um, uh, what are they called? Like right here, attach actor to component, the location, rotation, and scale, and you have snap to target and keep relative and keep world and uh, I don't know. But the funny thing also was that because of my um, kind of chipped off broken landscape that I have right now, my null position or the zero 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 axis on in my level is somewhere way out in the distance, somewhere in the sky. So somehow if I clicked the keep, I think relative, and I'm starting to kind of get how it works now, because if you select the keep uh, relative, then it gets the location that you get on the horse, which is zero, zero, zero. And then your character gets teleported to the zero, zero, zero of the map, I think. And then he was just falling out of the sky. Anyway, long story short, it was very hard to get the character correctly sitting on the horse in the right location um, without also the horse and the character just basically flying off in space like Frost did with the deer because collisions. <laughs> but I think I figured it out. Mm. So now you can mount the horse and ride it. But now I want the horse to be um, not just right there. I want the people to be able to find the horse, the player to find the horse somewhere, and then basically quote unquote tame it or try to um, make a connection with it that then makes it your horse. And that means I have to. <laughs> convert everything that I just built into the ABK version of the blueprint. And I tried that this afternoon and nothing works anymore. So yay, game development. Don't get discouraged. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a challenge. And th that is kind of the fun thing as well about game development, right? You try one thing and everything breaks. So you go a step back and then there is so many different ways of approaching a problem and tackling it. And a lot of people always said that game development is all about faking it, as in trying to make it look good and not actually doing the thing that you're doing. For example, by hiding your actual player character and just having a random skeletal mesh on your horse. Um, and because the character is hidden, all the stats and the huts will still exist. But I don't know. I just didn't like it. I, I don't know. So there is always a way, but you just need to find the right way that works for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just find the, the correct way of going about it for sure. 
Well, yeah. you're a correct way of going about it since there's so <laughs> many <laughs> potential yeah. correct ways of doing something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and again, if, if there's anybody in chat that has great ideas about this, hit me up on Discord. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, it. We're always open to help. <laughs> That's also one of the things about blueprints, that if you're using uh, marketplace, marketplace blueprints, it you might not get plug and play uh, because it might not mm -hmm. fit into the things you already have created. And because you yeah. don't know exactly how it works, sometimes you have to do some trial and error before you get it correctly, or maybe take the time to understand what each section actually does and why it does it. And it's the same with all the instruction videos out there. Like I was talking about earlier, that sometimes there's basically too much information out there because there's such a huge background to Unreal Engine and people are enjoying uh, putting out tutorials because they want to brag about what they actually can do. Uh, that one content uh, creator for that one uh, tutorial might not work for you and the way you have set it up, but look around and yeah. see other tutorials for exactly the same thing and maybe go a version back on Unreal as well instead of only focusing, uh, being focused on the version that you have because the others might have. A solution for you we had the same issue with the arrow uh shooting off the arrow that we couldn't get it to work and thurston were really uh, trying different things he had looked at a lot of videos uh, and finally we jumped in further into a video that he already looked at earlier that he discarded because the beginning was not what he was uh, focusing on but later on in the video uh the exact tutorial that he actually needed and the guidance for it were there to make it. And after he followed that, it worked. So yeah, don't be discouraged. If you don't get it the first time, uh, try different methods, look up different people uh, that do the same thing. So yeah, just yeah, uh, exactly. a heads up if you try to develop your own thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good tip indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, well, for anybody wondering, yes, it was again collisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always collisions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we have a few questions lined up. If the two of you are up for answering some of those. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, so I'll just uh, toss them out there and whichever one of you wants to comment on it or both of you, uh, feel free. So we'll just kind of tackle them that way. The first one is, uh, we'll just kind of start at the beginning here. What was the initial inspiration for making a game, uh, if anything, specifically about Yosemite as well? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't know. No, the thing is, I've never been there, first, first of all. I've only seen the beautiful pictures on the internet. And I've always thought about creating a game in um, a national park. Or the thing is, I love being in the mountains and in nature, but I live in the Netherlands. And I don't know if any of you have ever been here, but it's flat <laughs> AF and I hate it. And there is almost no nature. I am lucky to live in the south where there is at least a little bit of forests but it's really flat and really urban i guess and i personally am not really into that stuff i love the mountains and and the forests so that was one reason to go with this location um in hindsight it might have been easier to use a different location that was not just a huge valley between two mountains but hey we got here and we're making it work um but yeah i just found that it was a beautiful location and it had potential um it's somewhat remote of of the rest of the living world so it would make sense to not for example have npcs right away i don't know maybe they will be there at some point but that was something that i wanted to avoid a little bit and it also needed to be a serene and and um zen-ish location because 
the character needed to have some place to go and relax, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So basically just because it's beautiful, <laughs> it could have yeah. just as well been Yellowstone, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Yellowstone yeah. is also extremely dangerous though. So that might have been yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to set up collisions for uh, like sulfur pits in Yellowstone Park. Oh God! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> uh, so the next yeah. question then is: since this was really sort of community built uh, in a lot of ways, uh, what was was that the goal from the beginning to kind of open this up and have it as a very large collaborative project? Or did it just kind of happen over time that it ended up being created this way? No, it was, it was, I think, well, yeah, Frost, if you want to answer something, just hop in. But um, it was kind of the idea from the start. Um, one, because I can't, I can't do everything by myself. Um, and you can't keep but a secret. But it's also, hmm? I can't, keep, can't a keep a secret. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> No, yeah, it was it was because it actually started as a community idea. So at, I wanted to do this with the people that were watching my channel because like Frost said earlier, we were talking about it while we were actually playing a game. I think we were playing The Forest, actually. Um, and oh, possibly, in, yeah. In, in, yeah, I think we were playing The Forest in a uh, dedicated server with some more people. And we got into the talking about game development and an idea. and. It's basically that um, sort of um, um, game that you do when when um, everybody says a word or a sentence and you make a story of it. You know what I mean? That's kind of how this went. So I was like, oh, what about, what do you think of this? And then somebody else was like, oh yeah, and then this and this. And then somebody else and oh yeah. And then you could go this and that. And so it kind of developed the story and the idea developed with each other from basically nothing. And um, that changed over time a little bit because some angles were better. At first, we had a way less dark story in mind. Um, and right now, we're going with darker and more emotional because <laughs> who doesn't love drama, right? So, yeah. yeah it's, it's And we have a grayish was... and a deep <clears throat> dark one. Yeah, exactly. Potential. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're going that. with the deep dark the one. I've already are... decided that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was yeah, kind of easy twist, to right? go that way. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's see here. Um, as a kind of a follow up to that question, then, uh, now that you've had experience in this communal way of developing what are the important lessons you've learned or advice you'd give for someone else wanting to explore a similar style of development? Um, don't do it. No, just kidding. Of course not. No, um, <laughs> try to find people that you can really vibe with. Um, the people that started out with me in my community, like Simon and other people that are closely connected to the, to the project are people that I can really vibe with. And well, yeah, like, like friends we we are friends basically so we think on the same level we feel the same way about stuff um and um make sure that you don't that's one thing that i really had trouble with but literally don't try to do it all by yourself if you have a community around you that have skills or ideas <laughs> listen to them and use them as you can um yeah yeah frost yeah hit, hit use it. them as bouncing yeah. boards don't mm -hmm. don't play, yeah like i said earlier don't listen to basically more or less everything uh what people have to say and see what sticks and don't be afraid to ask for help uh or advice in in certain things because if you get wrapped up if you are solo or maybe a dual uh act of developers you can really get stuck if you don't have any outside interference in the way you're thinking. 
yeah. unless you really have everything mapped out from the beginning and not everybody has that a lot of people have ideas on where they want to go but some things will come up and you will get stuck there at some point so if that happens don't be afraid to ask for help that can be uh, either with your storyline with the gameplay with how you want to do things and also don't be afraid to scrap something that you already have done um before that <laughs> <don't listen> <laughs> <laughs> it it might it might help you uh, later on a uh, partition system but yeah <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah no but that Absolutely. is seriously so, yeah, even... a tip that i've heard from a lot of people before don't and that's what i did right away and which well it kind of worked out right now but also not um don't make your first project that you start working on your um your crown jewels or something like um I did, and it kind of worked out. But like any everybody I've heard and spoken about this says um, that you might have to scrap your ideas and your project multiple times before you get it right. And I was stubborn, and I didn't do it. And it kind of worked out now, but it might have also worked out way better if I did back then. But I'm mm, stubborn. Yeah, and. Another way you can get around with that is basically having two projects running at the same time. One that is really a, the main project that you want to really make beautiful and stuff like that and really develop and keep developing on for a long time. But have another project going on where you can test things out. Uh, test this and send that out uh, as, a, as a smaller game and get the feedback from it where you use some of the modules that you might be wanting to use in your main game and maybe also just as a distraction from the more serious one that you are uh, trying to make uh, so that you can keep on developing but not if you get stuck uh, but have it as a playground uh, where you're not afraid yeah. to do things yeah exactly mm -hmm. Um, I, I watched a, when I started, like I said before, the Unreal Sensei had a tutorial called, um, um, I don't know what it was called, but he was basically, the project that we created was called something like Beginner Creek or Creek Beginner. It was a medieval house at the end of a river in a forestry area. If you look him up, you will see the thumbnail, you know exactly what I mean. And that was my main project for a long time where I did a lot of this, I think I actually started working on the map in that project and then kind of basically copy and paste it or migrated the map into another project and, and, and refined it and started working on it more. And also, don't be afraid to have fun. Um, <laughs> I'm working on the animal update and I'm not going to lie, I don't want to have hunting in the game, but it is damn satisfying once you have your collisions and your particle effects working to just <laughs> go around and shoot some arrows into <clears throat> stuff and, and animals. And so, yeah, you know, at some point you're going to be sick of playing your own game because you've seen it all so many times. Um, but don't be afraid to have fun with the things that you just created and get the kick out of it when once it works. Mm. Very important. Yeah, absolutely. It also sounds like it's important to get you a Simon Frost as well, or at least someone yes. who's <laughs> going to very politely well, he, he is tell you no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We need we need the one who will tell us, you know, I love you, <laughs> but that wrong. might not be the best Don't idea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So next question is, uh, do you think having this experience now that you would ever want to go as a full-time game dev? So that is a very fun question. I've thought about that a lot of times. Um, yes. If my game or, I mean, the thing right now is I do it as a hobby and because we're doing it with the community and we all put our time in it, um, we kind of agreed upon um, 
we <laughs> okay, we have not created a profit yet, not at all. Um, and that is also something that you need to be very realistic about if you're a indie dev or a solo person doing this. It's going to cost you a lot of time and also a lot of money. And you need to be prepared to do that or put even more time into save that money by creating stuff yourself. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's an expensive hobby if you want to do it right. Um, and that is fine. Um, and with us, we kind of made an agreement of we do not really, if we start to turn a profit at some point right now, we will put it back into the game and its development. Um, but if it goes crazy enough that we can actually live off of it, heck yeah, I will. But right now it's by far not a realistic uh, uh, perspective. And I think that also has to do with being self-published because, well, I, I told you, Tina, already, I am totally not a marketing person. I uh I can take pretty pictures, I guess, but I am not one for headlines or cool uh cool uh, uh stories or whatever. Um so it's also kind of hard to to raise awareness about your project. Um and the reason I did that is because I've also heard a lot of negative stories about using publishers. Um mm -hmm. and I kind of was also I'm a little afraid because I made an assumption which it has no um, actual, is not based on any facts whatsoever. But a feeling I have is when you have a publisher, maybe kind of the same like a, a record label for a musician is they might start pushing the developer to put out more content or change their project because they think they know what's best. Um, mm -hmm. And this is my my baby, you know, I'm not going to, change what I want to create um, unless the feedback community tells me so, of course, with the majority, but in at least a rough idea I want to keep in there. And that as well as a, um, a publisher taking a certain percentage of all the profit or the revenue was also something that I was or am not ready for yet. So. I also don't know what kind of agreement you can make. There's probably a lot of things that you can um, do with that. And I did get some offers by people that told me that they were publishers and they were interested. But I am also not a legal counsel, so I don't know how all of it works. And I was just like, let me just build my game first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's also why it sometimes is publish. A, yeah, <laughs> it's a good idea to to contact the, the smaller communities of, uh, of streamers because they can actually do some of the publishing for you and you yeah, get exactly. feedback at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, that's yeah, one thing that's, more, but I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> no, well, that's a very that's, good point, yeah. Simon. Content creators and I swear to you, are the best kind of publicity and marketing you can get. And they often do it for free, or at least for a key to your game, or a copy of your game. Um, and it's worth it. I promise you that. I think the sales that we got until now are basically all coming from people that watched content creators. I'm almost sure of it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, the occasional Twitter post that I try to put out, but um, I don't have a lot of <laughs> followers. So where is it going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that also kind of falls in line with the community aspect that you were talking about, too, of making sure that you're reaching out and actively making those connections. And yeah. like you said, finding smaller content creators or even other developers and making those smaller connections first instead of trying to tackle exactly. the big huge publishing you can just form kind of a smaller tighter knit group of people yeah. that you can then rely on a little bit in the beginning process of this yeah yeah doing, and don't be afraid that. to contact yeah you go first no, continue <laughs> don't be afraid to 
contact the bigger, con bigger content creators. Like I messaged a lot of them and not all of them responded. I was very happy when Game Edge did. I mean, I think most of you guys know him. If you watch any kind of gameplay YouTube, he is very big. And he's a very cool guy, very relaxed guy. Um, but there were also a lot of bigger ones that did not respond, which is also fine. I know people are busy and that they have a lot of, uh, lot of games to cover. Um, and that's why these smaller streamers are so important as well, because they usually have time and they are happy to um, cover your game if, they, if, if it's in their, um, in their interest, right? So, yeah. Use content creator. Yeah. I swear to God. Uh, the other thing I want to say is also, if you, if you don't want to put in a lot of um, money, uh, basically to build your own bigger game, do some smaller games with maybe free or cheaper assets where you also get to learn how to actually develop and maybe already set up then uh, release that part of it while you're working on the bigger one. And that might make a bit of profit that you can get to buy uh, bigger assets and also to be able to uh, let your network grow uh, where you can reach out to multiple people. But like Thurston talked about before with uh, marketing and stuff like that, if, if you're not sure about if that's, that fits you, then don't do it like he didn't do. Uh, but also be aware when it comes to content creators that if you have some sort of setup or giving keys away for content creators, you will also get scams. So oh, be aware hey, of yeah. those. Uh, we had go in chat. live chat. Yeah, go in live chat if they are live, uh, the people that they say they are. Uh, ask them, go into their channel, look for their um, email address. Does that match the one that you got it from? Email that, that address to make sure that's the one. We were we actually had one email from a content creator that said, uh, "Oh, I'm this than this person. I would love to." And we saw that he was live. We went into him and asked him, uh, "Is this you?" Uh, we heard that you wanted a key, and we were just uh, talking about uh, some things. And we did that live in chat, and he said, oh, "That's not me, mate." Uh, I have so, no idea what you're talking about and who and you are. I have no idea but what you're talking about. Yeah. Show, tell me what you're what you're working on, and maybe I'll, yeah. I'll. So, and he eventually did a pretty long stream on it. But he also told us that he was aware that people are were using his name and were scamming it. So yeah. be aware of that. There are people that are trying to pretend to be content creators, get your key, and resell them online. It's a sad but true life. And mm -hmm. Yeah, the same thing happens with pirating, I guess, once your game gets a little bit of traction. I haven't yet found Yosemite Forest Ranger on any pirated websites, but then again, we are not that big yet. <laughs> and another well, thing for funding. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so another thing is also, if you're going to do your own marketing, you can think about, like we did with crowdfunding, um, but also be sure if you're going to do crowdfunding to think realistically and check out what the, um, the, the, the terms and conditions basically are from using that crowdfunding or crowdfunding provider. These words are hard. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So we went with Indiegogo <laughs> because they, are, um, they give you the option to use flexible goals, which basically means that you don't have to wait until the full campaign is done to get your money. Now, for example, as far as I could find, so I don't know if it's the actual truth, but as far as I could find from my research was that, for example, Kickstarter, you have to get your full um, goal. And if you don't reach your goal, all your money is gone and goes back to the backers. Now, of course, mm -hmm. that is realistic and it's cool for the backers, but there are also backers that want to help you with your game and contributors that want to help you with your project. And they don't give a, a 
crisp um, if you make your goal or not. But they just want to support you. And that's why we went with Indiegogo. We have now a few supporters, but we are long ways away from our goal. Um, but we also have the possibility that if we don't make our goal, that we can still give the people that did contribute their uh, perks and we are still able to use the funds that we gathered to use at least a little bit for the things that we want. So be mindful of where you go with your um, with your options and, and what you're actually looking for. Okay. Yeah, and our goal is not even that unrealistic. Like people, some, some projects, they, they raise like $10,000. We are only asking for $650. Um, so it's it's all about marketing. I like I said, I tried to push it out on Twitter, but if you only have like I don't know, I don't know how many I have, but if you have well, let's say I have one hundred followers, if nobody sees it or they don't use Twitter, Simon, then it doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, I have Twitter, I just don't repost everything you said. You said. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You know what yeah, I'm hearing? Also, you need to, yeah. What I'm hearing is from team? this is we need to get this man a mega grant. <laughs> is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anything is welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But also be clear about what you basically want. We we set that goal and that's basically the price for those four animals that's inside uh that we are talking about inside the indiegogo page uh yeah. we talked about if it should be more or less or whatever but here you see what each step of uh money you will get inside the game and it's because they are great assets so they cost a bit more uh yeah. so yeah, that is uh, why we do this this way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's all driven from just wanting to make a cool game, which I think is really awesome. <laughs> With awesome people, yeah. Yeah. All right, I have one last question for the both of you, and this one might get both myself and Thurston in trouble. So I'm sorry, Simon, oh ahead boy. of time. I'm, I'm trusting <laughs> you to be the, the mitigator here. <laughs> yeah. You're on I damage control. <laughs> so what's next? What's the next big plan uh, that you're going to tackle for this project? um well basically um after this stream i'm just gonna delete the engine and go on vacation forever no just kidding of course um <laughs> no the next thing so we have um on the steam page there is a roadmap with well roadmap i just say future plans or future ideas because roadmaps include some kind of planning which i don't do very well um but the wildlife update is up next um and once we have the wildlife update going with everything we want in that, which includes um, uh, trapping um, just more wildlife in the map. Um, but so trapping is a big thing. And um, we've also have a building system currently in the game that I'm not going to um, make available right away um, because we want to refine that and, and personalize it more. Um, but eventually, we were thinking about also adding, um, yeah, call it optional quests, I guess. Um, so there is a lot of areas. And of course, with the expansion of the map, there are areas where um, there is more emptiness. So I was thinking, for example, and don't pin me to it because it might change. Um, but I was thinking of using some of those emptier areas um, for the player to get some sort of quest of, um, uh, hey, I'm, I don't know, Hank, and I want to move to the valley. Can you please build me a nice cabin over there and there? And then you basically get a location where you need to clear the area, the, chop the trees away, and then with the building system that becomes available, you uh, can build a cabin to your liking. and 
or also furnish it with furniture that you have to craft from basically gathering resources in the valley. And then you get a little bit more into your survival game, but it still has some kind of story aspect to it. And it's also, I don't know, it's not, it's optional, right? It's not like you have to do this to survive the game, but it's optional. And of course, the expansion of the story is a very big thing on the list. Uh, like we said in the beginning of the stream, only the um, first part of the story is in the game right now. If you find any tapes in the game, it's basically going to cover kind of the childhood of Theodore. Um, and we have more of the childhood uh, parts. And then you get into the adolescence and, and well, the more other stuff in his life. And, of course, the more tragic stuff. Um, so there's a lot of things on the horizon. Farming is also going to be a thing that I would like to uh, include. And, and once we have a good uh, expansion of the map, maybe cars. I mean, you saw the car that he drove into or drove in with. I mean, that's rendered useless. So maybe there is another car with maybe a Forest Ranger logo on it. I don't know. We have a lot of ideas, but we have to see if we can actually get them in here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically also smaller missions with park ranger duties that will uh, come in. Uh, like yeah. Thurston talked about with the trank gun, it could be that there were a bear <clears throat> a place where it shouldn't be and you had to do park ranger stuff to get it away from there or whatever. Uh, yeah. 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 Those awesome. will be a lot of the side, side quests, basically. Yeah. So you get a yeah. break from having to follow the storyline. And just have to explore, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're still going to be exploring, but it's maybe less of an object. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I it's guess that's. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's ideas of plenty, but just so little time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, scope. Yep. Gotta love. Gotta mm -hmm. love scope. <laughs> no, I do not. Well, with that. Uh, do either of you have any final thoughts, final statements you want to give to the the wonderful people watching before we wrap up? Um, well, if you want to be part of a great community project, hit us up on the Discord, of course. Um, <laughs> and don't be afraid to start your own project and see where you get to. I mean, exactly. The amount of frustrations I have from stuff that is not working or I can't get to work the way I want, um, they are annoying. But the moments where something does work and you get that kick of, oh my God, I just did that and it worked. That is <laughs> such a rush. I mean, it's, it's a, I, yeah, it's, I wanted to make a comparison to drugs, but I never did drugs. So I have no idea, but. It's so good. Don't do drugs. It's so good. It's it's <laughs> it gives such a rush. And yeah. it makes you feel it makes you feel really good and and really oh maybe kind of powerful, I guess. Um it's just a great kick to get stuff working and yeah, don't be afraid to try. Mm -hmm. And especially with the Unreal Engine and all the uh available resources, it's it's easier than ever, I guess, to create your own game. You just need to have the time. To put it into it and if you are if you're a person that basically gets stuck uh, when you do things and uh, when no when you get stuck that you go into yourself and don't really progress that much make sure you have some sort of bouncing board uh, in some way because the amount of times that thurston has just jumped into voice chat with any of us and said, oh, I don't know how to do this. And um, let me explain what I'm doing. And I can't get this to work. And then 10 minutes after, yay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's, and, a, it's a day. Oh, I got it to work. Almost. And I did this and this and this. And we're just half the time. We just, yeah, it's good. Bravo. Uh, <laughs> And he begins ranting about how he he did everything, and he forgets <laughs> that we haven't been part of his thought process because he was boarded up within his own mind doing it. 
instead of being in voice yeah. chat and talking about it when he did it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that's what I meant with the rubber ducky, right? Sometimes, and it sounds really stupid, but um, a lot of, if there is, like I said before, any programmers in chat, you probably all know the term rubber ducky. Um, it's basically you need to have something to tell your thought process to, or someone, of course. Um, and in this case, I have my community. And they don't know the first thing about the Unreal Engine or game development in the engine itself. But like I said, I have the luck to have a lot of logical thinkers that can kind of follow my process or if I just show the notes and, and how the code kind of um, goes from point A to point Z, I guess, um, it, they can kind of follow it along and, and help out with just figuring out my thought process or just getting me out of my own <laughs> my own infinite loop basically um and tell you to go to b before you go to yeah exactly and that's something that's really important <laughs> even if they even if they don't give any advice just the, the 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 fact that you're talking out loud and you can um um sp speak your thoughts out Usually that helps already with me. I don't know why, because I talk a lot in my head to myself when I'm doing stuff. And somehow speaking it out loud works better. And then sometimes it just clicks and it works. It's it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's some yeah. fantastic advice from both of you. And I wholeheartedly agree with all of it. Um, I, again, think just this development story in general is so awesome. I am so excited to see what else you're able to put together. It's going to be incredible. I just know it. And I also want to thank both of you for taking the time to come on the show today and to talk about everything that you've done and to give a lot of this really good advice to the viewers today. I really appreciate your time and for you being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us and being so so welcoming and everything. It's really great. Had a great time. I was a little <laughs> bit nervous. You probably didn't notice, but it was fun and I enjoyed it. Pretty really good. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching and being here. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. it would be terrible if I invited you on and then was like, well, show me your stuff, I guess. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, I, I can't thank you enough, really, both of you so much. And also, thank you everyone who came and watched as well. The show wouldn't be what it is without you and your interaction. Um, it's always the best being able to see your responses to the stuff that we're saying. And there was uh, one question I didn't get asked that I'll just toss in here when you were talking about horses. Of course, we had someone ask uh, when horse armor was coming and, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> So hmm. the show, you know, without the, the fun little quips and stuff like that, it wouldn't be what it is. Yeah. So thank you for also taking the time and being here. We post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel and Twitch channel, Unreal Engine. Don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as come say hi in our forums where we where you, <laughs> messing up my own outro, where you can get the latest news and find all the links associated with today's stream. But with that, once again, thank you both so, so much. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see y'all next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye everybody. Bye.